going to ask you three questions to start off, uh, Derry. Uh, okay. Question one, uh, tell us about when and how you became politically conscious. And the next question is, tell us how, when you became involved in democratic education. And the third question is, tell us about your new book, Another Way is Possible, Becoming a Democratic Teacher in a State School. Number one, then, how did you become politically conscious? Oh, my goodness. That's, that's an interesting one. I think this began very early in my life. Wow. I think I was probably... It started when I was about seven years old what? because in the English class system, you know, the, the rich kids go off to boarding schools at the age of seven. It's quite a disastrous and shocking thing to do to kids. But because they're rich kids, it's OK. Um, but I had some rich kid friends because my mum cleaned the local church. My dad was a bus driver from Dublin. So we were very much a working class family but I mixed in high society. Some of my friends were, came from the rich families that went to the church where my mum was the cleaner. And uh, I grew up in the, uh, 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 the Second World War ended when I was five. And uh, most of the boys all wanted to be Spitfire pilots. And uh, I very much wanted to be a Spitfire pilot. We live quite near a famous Battle of Britain airfield called Biggin Hill. But uh, these rich kids said to me, oh, Derry, we're going off to our schools and you're going to go to the council school. So you'll never be a Spitfire pilot. They might allow you to fill the petrol tanks, but you'll never be a pilot. And I think that was probably the beginning of my political education. And then my dad would come home from his bus driving, complaining about the attitudes of bus inspectors um, and uh, the fact that in the canteen of the bus driver's garage, um, they didn't have carpets on the floor, but the manager's canteen had carpets on the floor. So what my dad said to me, he says, whenever you get a job, make sure that you're paid monthly and not weekly. And wherever you work, make sure there's carpets on the floor. That was about the sole careers advice that I got from my dad. And then a little bit later on in school, we were divided into the fast kids, the middle speed kids and the slow kids. And although I was one of the fast kids, I noticed that most of the fast kids lived in big houses and had cars and televisions. The kids in the middle class lived in houses that were joined to other houses, maybe had a motorbike and probably only some had televisions. Whereas in the slow class, None of the parents lived in big houses, none of them had cars, and none of them had televisions. So it gradually dawned on me that this business of intelligence and which school you went to seemed to have more to do with how much money your parents had. Um, and then at 11, we had to take a test uh, to go to um, either a kind of gymnasium, a school that where you might, if you're lucky, go to university, or a school where you might, if you're lucky, work in the local bakery. Um, and for some reason, somebody must have made a mistake marking the papers because I got sent to the school that might take you to university. In fact, more than that, I got an interview at an expensive private school. Um, but my father had a form to fill in and it said, father's occupation. They seem to be more interested in the parent than the child. And my father, in good Irish fashion, said he wrote on this paper, none of your fecking business. Strangely, I didn't get the place. I never quite understood why. But um, all these are the little messages of the English class system. And I became more and more antagonistic towards it. And when I went to the fast school, that should go to university. Of course, I didn't go to university, but some of the kids did. Um, when I was uh, 12, I had to choose between learning German and uh, learning Latin. And uh, I had f full knowledge of meeting Henning Grainer one day. So I decided I shouldn't <laughs> learn German, but I should, sh I should learn Latin. And the head teacher said to me, why do you want to do Latin, Hannum? So I said, well, 
because my dad says I might want to be a priest or a doctor, which I didn't, but I suppose I might have done. And the headmaster said to me, what does your father do? And instead of saying it's none of your feckin' business, which is probably what I should have said, I said, oh, he drives the number 47 bus that I come to school on. Anyway, I did Latin, God knows why, because I didn't learn much. And then the next year, we had to choose between art and Greek, would you believe it? And my dad says, ah, sure, you have to learn the Greek because you might want to be a priest or a doctor. It was all that stuff again. And I went through the whole thing again. The head teacher said to me, what does your father do? And I didn't say none of your fucking business. Fecking is the Irish word, not the English word, which is rude. But the Irish word fecking is acceptable, even in good company, like, like tonight. So I'm afraid my experience as a kid brought this unfairness and injustice of the English class system home to me. And that I realised quite early on that the school system seemed to be based on separating kids out and making sure that some didn't have very good opportunities. I mean, I didn't make very good use of the posh school that I went to. I was more or less chucked out at 16 and went through a whole lot of jobs that I didn't enjoy very much. But that gave me a strong feeling that something had got to be done about these schools to make them fairer places. How's that, John? That's a fairly long-winded uh, answer. What was question two? Well, uh, uh, question two was, tell us uh, how, when, and why you became involved with democratic education. Oh, golly. You've got to jump a lot there. Perhaps I should answer question three first, because question three was about my book. Yes, tell um, us about your book. Uh, if that involved... Okay, I'll tell you about the book. Well, after doing various jobs I didn't enjoy much, eventually I, I worked for Oxfam and had a job going around secondary schools talking to the older kids about the work of Oxfam. And I found I really enjoyed that. And then I worked for a while in a group therapy unit in a psychiatric hospital with young people. And the treatment in this hospital was talking and the community was run as a democracy. We had a meeting every morning and a meeting every afternoon. The treatment was talking and explaining and sharing your life difficulties. Very little medication, uh, no electric shocks and absolutely no brain surgery, though that was still going on at this time in the 60s. But it was run as a kind of democratic community. And I thought this is really interesting. And a combination of working with these young people in this therapeutic community and my work for Oxfam made me think, you know, perhaps teaching would be quite interesting. And perhaps if you become a teacher, you have a chance to do things in a slightly different way. So I trained as a teacher. Um, uh, that was not easy because psychology lectures, for example, were about Skinner and rats learning to press little pedals to get food. Um, and uh, Pavlov about dogs salivating when they hear a bell ring that means food might be coming. And I remember saying to the psychology lecture, hey, mate, uh, I don't want to teach dogs or rats, but I'd rather like to teach children, if that's OK with you. Can I learn a bit about children? Anyway, he was so glad to get me out of the class. I more or less made up my own course and went to the psychology department in the college library. And I found this long shelf of dusty books that nobody ever read. Guess who they were by? A.S. Neal, Leo Tolstoy, John Dewey, Homer Lane, etc., etc., etc. And that was an absolutely eye-opener for me. And so I try and tell this story of what led up to me becoming a teacher in the beginning of the book. But of course, having read those people, I didn't want to be a, a, a normal teacher in a normal school. But I went to, we had to go on teaching placements. Now, I went to a primary school, and fortunately the teacher was ill, and the head teacher was delighted I could do what I liked, basically, for eight weeks. So we sat in a circle and talked about what the kids were interested in, and they more or less created their own projects, and we had democratic meetings, etc., etc. It was an attempt to try out Summerhill in a primary school. It was brilliant, 
the parents were very happy, the head teacher was happy because he didn't have to pay another teacher. But then I had a teaching placement in a secondary school. It was an absolute disaster. Um, I allowed the kids to talk about the history of democracy in the history classes. We talked about chartism and we gradually got on to discussing how they felt about school and they didn't like it much. They didn't get on that well with the teachers and they all found the school a bit oppressive. And word got back to the staff room that this student teacher was allowing the kids in the class to complain about the teachers and complain about the regime of the school. So I got heavily disciplined and told I wasn't to try out these democratic meetings and all this nonsense. I was to do as I was told. And from then on, I had a teacher sitting in the back of all my classes, this checking that North I Korea. wasn't teaching North revolution. Korea. This is uh, North Korea, right? Yes, more or less. North Korea, uh, more or less. So I thought, this is it. I've had enough of teaching. I'm going to go and do something else. But the college said to me, I was quite pleased. They said, look, don't give up. You'd got on so well on your first one. We'll more or less ignore the second one and send you out to another elementary school, another primary school. And that was great. I found the class teacher was an ex-army officer. He was also a bit of an alcoholic. And I, I said to him, uh, uh, look, do, do, do you, you, if you like, you can go to the staff room and have a drink and I'll take over the class. And he said, why, why, what do you want to do? So I said, well, I've got this crazy idea that I'm going to let the kids study projects that they're interested in and we're going to have a class meeting and make our decisions as a democracy. And instead of saying over my dead body, this guy said, that's fantastic. He said, I've always wanted to try something like that. Let's do it together. So we did. And it was brilliant. It was a kind of team teaching thing. And once again, parents got involved and that was fine. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going to spend my life in a primary school. But I couldn't find a job in a primary school. And one or two jobs came up in sort of democratic alternative schools. But I thought, no, uh, I want to work where all the kids are. I don't really want to work in a private school. And then just by chance, I saw an advertisement, humanities teacher in a secondary school, but to teach history, geography, English, religious education and social studies all to one class to try and help the kids in the transition from the primary school to the secondary school. I thought that sounds brilliant. So I went for the interview and the head said, what kinds of things would you do you imagine doing? And I said, well, would it be OK if I had a democratic meeting? Or would it be OK if I let the kids choose some of the stuff that they study? And he said, well, it might be a bit of a problem with the heads of the departments who you'll be working for. But I don't mind as long as you don't cause too much trouble. And uh, so I had the support of the head. And I, uh, the, the book really is about my first two years gradually creating a democratic learning community in this school. These kids had all just failed the 11 plus exam. So they, they, they were a bit disillusioned and many of the parents, especially the middle class, it was very socially mixed, but the middle class parents felt, oh, that was the end of it. There was no hope educationally for their children because they'd failed this examination at 11. What an appalling thing to do to kids to destroy their confidence and esteem and hope at that age. It was criminal, but that's what the system did. And it, it hasn't changed much in many respects in England. Anyway, because these kids had failed this exam, I think, the parents were absolutely delighted when the kids started to come home and say, hey, this is fantastic. We're having meetings in our class. We're deciding what to learn. Our teacher, you know, seems not like any other teacher that we've ever had. I had six other classes all working um, with this kind of organisation, with a range of subjects, but I was the only one trying to work in this democratic way. It was incredibly successful. The kids became very, very enthusiastic, did masses of learning. It was put before the internet, so it wasn't always that easy to find material on the things they were interested in. I did a bit of the teaching that I was asked to do by the heads of department, but not much. 
at least 30% of curriculum time was on the kids' projects, and at least 10% on cur of curriculum time was spent on class meetings. They made all sorts of class laws. They made a class newspaper that covered all the walls of the room. If you broke the class laws, you ended up in the class court on Friday afternoons. All sorts of things happened. We got invited to local teachers' colleges to talk about school democracy. We got in the local press. We got invited by the national press down to London. The Sun, and if anyone knows the English press, the Sun is owned by Murdoch. And uh, I thought it was a bit risky, but we did it. And the paper treated us very well and wrote the wrote a report about the class meeting and the class court and the class democracy. It was very friendly. And uh, People have said to me over the years, you should have written that up because it's so unusual. I went on to another school with a more senior job. I ended up as vice principal, acting principal of another school. But the most exciting time of my teaching was those first two years developing the class democracy. And people had said, you should write it up. I got mountains of notes. I got the minutes of all the class meetings. I got quite a few of the kids' projects that I'd managed to hang on to. And uh, so eventually, years later, I thought, OK, I will try. After I'd retired from school teaching but was working as an inspector, um, I start to write it down. And lo and behold, on Facebook, an amazing piece of synchronicity, one of the kids who'd been chair of the class meeting for a while, 45 years before, contacted me on Facebook. And he was in touch still with quite a few young people from that class, all of whom remembered the experience of being in the democratic community from the age of 11 to 13, and saying it had had an effect on their whole lives. So that was an amazing opportunity. And uh, one or two of the students have written one of the chapters in the book. So that was pretty extraordinary. Um, well, that's the story of the book. Um, I, I'm doing it half or smash words. I've got a half price offer on this this week. It's two dollars forty five. I've actually eight copies have been downloaded this week or oh, today. Actually, can't quite believe it. Um, and incidentally, the two dollars, smash words are great, they only keep 50 cents. Two dollars of, of it will come to me and that will go straight to the festival. So if I can persuade anyone to buy the book or buy half a dozen of them, um, uh, it is available on, on Amazon as a paperback as well, but it's a bit more expensive there. So I recommend a download, cheaper than a cup of coffee, and you'll be doing a favour to, uh, to Summerhill. That was question three. Now I've forgotten question two. What was question two, John? Well, basically, you, 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 you did both of those, how you became involved in democratic education. So the question is now for me, where in the continuum did you uh, meet Jerry Mintz and, and Yakov, and or where in the continuum did you do the study, uh, of the 2000, I think the 2001 study, uh, to get that became a national law regard to student voice. Ah, well, I, I sort of had a school career and at 52, I'd got blood pressure of about sort of 2,000 over 1,000 and uh, or the other way around, whatever it is. Um, and uh, was getting a bit tired. And uh, I was I had the chance to retire because um, the new inspection system was being created called Ofsted. Yes. And uh, they were very short of people who taught art subjects. Now, actually, I'm a, I'm a jazz musician, really, rather than a teacher. But I got recruited because I'd been an acting head teacher, but I was also got an arts background. And that was unusual. Most arts teachers don't make it to be head teachers in the English system. They're too busy organising the choir and the Christmas festival and, and everything, and they never get promoted. In fact, the highest incidence of nervous breakdown in English subject teachers is music teachers. Um, so I got recruited um, into the inspection system. And I thought at first this was really interesting because uh, I'd had a hand in creating a new 16 plus music exam 
which instead of learning the length of Beethoven's toenails on his 48th birthday, did much more interesting things like compose music in any genre you like and learn to perform in any genre you like. Um, so I wanted to see how this syllabus was working out in other schools. That was really my motive for becoming an inspector. Also, I'd worked in the same school for 14 years and it gave me a chance to see other, other schools. I gradually realised, though, that this inspection business was pretty... didn't make teachers happy at the thought of inspectors turning up, let's put it like that. And I did it for a few years until Summerhill was threatened and I got to know Zoe a bit and she invited me to come and do the keynote talk at Summerhill in 1999 just after the inspectors had been and we were all very afraid they were going to try and close the school, which they did. Um, and that gave me a chance as an inspector to work for Summerhill against the inspection system. And as you know, Zoe's lawyers, we won the case and part of my job was to advise the lawyers semi-secretly on what the inspectors had done wrong, why it was such a badly conducted inspection. So that was the end of my career as an inspector. But then I got recruited to the Council of Europe because I'd always run my schools in as democratic a way as possible with kids being involved in every level of participation, including the school board, the governing body, etc., etc. Effective school councils that weren't tokenistic but had budgets and made real decisions involved students in teacher appointments and as many ways as we possibly could. I got recruited by the Council of Europe um, for their Education for Democratic Citizenship Human Rights Education project. And then I was working with groups of teachers and kids in many different countries in Europe. How can we make our schools more experientially democratic? The idea was if you want kids to learn about democracy, you have to do it in schools and not just listen to teachers talk about it and pass tests. You had to create the schools as democratic communities. And at that time, the English government had changed and we got a new education minister, Tony Blair became prime minister, and the new education minister wanted to create a citizenship curriculum in England, which we hadn't had. And I was able to persuade him to include the idea of democratic decision-making into the school curriculum for all 14 to 16 year olds in state schools. We managed to do that. It became part of the curriculum. Um, we got a big research budget. We started training teachers to teach it. We trained new inspectors to inspect it. But the chief inspector said it was rubbish and that for kids to make democratic decisions in school was a waste of time. They should be learning more maths. And he attacked the, uh, the minister in the press. And the minister said to me, oh dear, I'm under a bit of pressure here. Have we got any evidence that uh, introducing democracy into schools doesn't make the exam results worse? And I said, well, hmm, I think we have. My experience as an inspector is on the whole, the more kids are involved in decision making, the better the school is doing but I hadn't got any evidence. So I was given some money, quite a bit actually, and told I, I got 24 hours to do the research and write the research report, more or less. You know what politics is like. Um, so I did, and I found 20 schools out of the 3,500 in England, secondary schools, that were much more democratic and much more student participation than the average. In some schools, all the kids were playing some sort of responsible role in the way the school was run. Uh, and not just in the school, but in the wider community as well, as had been the case in, in my own school. Um, and what I found was that the more participative, the more democratic schools, guess what? Far from getting worse exam results, got better exam results. They had better attendance figures and they had very, very few kids excluded for antisocial behaviour compared with the average for all schools in England in that kind of socio-economic environment. So we compared like with like. 
we looked at rural schools, inner city schools, suburban schools, and in every case, these schools were more successful. The more they involved the students democratically in running the school, the more successful, even by the conventional indicators of examination scores, attendance and exclusions. And that became known, a bit embarrassing, but it became known as the Hannum Report. You can still yeah. find it online. And uh, it was the first really piece of evidence that working democratically in the state system actually improved conventional standards and didn't undermine them. And the particular group that did most conspicuously better in the more democratic schools were working class boys. And I thought that was really interesting because that's the group that most commonly fails in English schools and provides, of course, the statistics for the criminal justice system. Yeah. A lot of them end up in prison and cost the state a great deal of money. Um, so we persuaded the school system to take on the idea of student democracy and responsible decision, responsible, what was it called? Yes, um, democratic decision making and responsible action. In other words, it wasn't enough for the kids to just make plans. They had to carry out their projects and then evaluate them. Now, of course, most schools didn't do it. Uh, about 25% of state schools took it seriously. About another 25% tried, and about 50% did their best to did their best to put up a kind of smokescreen that they were doing something, but nothing very much happened. That lasted for 10 years, but then we had a change of government, and it was all thrown out. And instead of democracy, we got British values. Well, I won't go into that. Um, the people interested in decolonisation might like to have a discussion about what British values are. Uh, that would be fun, but I don't think we have time here. Uh, so that's, I think, the report that you mentioned. Yes. Uh, and five years later, the official government research organisation, the National Foundation of Educational Research, did another study um, that confirmed what I'd found. And... The, the couple of Austrian academics in Innsbruck University called Mega and Novak have done a meta-study of about 30,000 international studies on student participation. And I was very pleased, actually, that out of all that lot, my, my one got into the last 30 as being credible. So the government's never been able to rubbish it it just ignores it. It's sitting on a shelf somewhere and no one takes any notice of it. But sometimes Pete, Jerry Mintz will say to me, well, it, the change didn't last long, eight years. Well, that's true. But in those eight years, thousands of young people had the opportunity to participate in democratic decision making and responsible action. So even though these things don't last, I think they're worth doing. And you should always take the opportunity to influence policy if you possibly can. Hey, Derry, uh, all right. Uh, let me read another statement you made, because now we're getting into the present, if you will. Uh, this is a statement you made, so listen, everyone. My experience is, is limited in the area of the white rural working class kids, particularly those who were coming uh, to school and leaving secondary school unable to read effectively. From my reading of Paulo Freire, I concluded that these kids need conscientization time apart from the normal mixed age class gender discussions that happen with us during the normal day. The Summer Hills School have very little experience with working class disadvantaged kids, so maybe just an open such, dis such disadvantaged kids so they uh, can discuss between me and would provoke some debate about how can we conscientize the democratic education movement? Well, it's a bit late, isn't it? And it's been the end of another good day to appear to say something a bit critical of the democratic education movement. Um, but, um, and please jump in if you really disagree with me. And I know this doesn't apply, for example, to some charter schools in the States, like um, the High School for the Recording Arts um, in Minnesota or 
high tech high in California. Um, I know there are many successful uh, schools in the States working with kids of color, but we do have a problem in England. Um, and I do see it reflected a bit in the European democratic schools movement. Um, you don't see an awful lot of inner city black faces or inner city impoverished underprivileged white faces either. And this seems to me because the democratic schools movement is basically fee paying in Europe, apart from Israel, of course, which is the magnificent exception where the, the state funding for the democratic schools. And I know Hadira, for example, where Yakov started his first school is pretty underprivileged place. It's very much a working class town stroke city. And now they have three democratic schools in Hadira. It's almost impossible to find a school that isn't a democratic school. So I really make an exception for Israel. But um, certainly in England, and my impression is in most European democratic schools, because they're fee paying, I don't attack them for this. It's not their fault. And I'm very glad they exist. I must say that on Summerhill's 100th birthday. If it wasn't for Summerhill, as Peter Gray just said, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing and none of us would be here. Um, and my whole teaching career would have, I probably would have never happened. It was only because I read Neil's books. So I see schools like Summerhill and Sudbury Valley and, and Netzwerk, I must say, in Berlin and L'Ecole Dynamique in Paris, I see these schools as pioneers of possibility. They show what can be done. So I wouldn't dream of criticising them for charging fees. What else can they do? If they didn't charge fees, they wouldn't be able to exist. But I'm a little bit worried now that I'm seeing international franchising outfits getting busy franchising democratic schools at really quite expensive fees, charging the startup people a startup fee and then asking for a proportion of the fee income to go back to head office. This starts to really bother me. I'll whisper under my breath the Acton Academies. And when I've seen films of the Acton Academies, they look to me to be pretty white, exclusive, middle class places. So what can we do in the democratic edu education movement until the funding becomes available to support them? What can we do to make them more inclusive? As far as I know, there's one school in Holland that uh, I'm coming to you, Jerry. There's one school in Holland, uh, democratic, fully democratic school that has state funding, but it's only one. Sorry. So a couple of things. Number one, I posted your, I found your uh, Panem report and I posted the link to it. Oh, thank you. And I hadn't heard of this before, so I can't wait to look at it. It's because uh, as I've said over and over again, we just really desperately need research about a lot of this stuff. Now, a couple of things. One is I did write a book about, uh, or sort of a, a book about my uh, experiences in a public school called I Was a Spy in the Public Schools. Yeah. So, so that, I don't know, you, you've seen it, right? And, and it's an e-book, isn't it? Yes, I've seen it. Second, the other thing is this. As you know, we have the School Starters course. Well, in our course, we strongly recommend that we do what I used to do in my school, which is have a sliding scale tuition. And so the schools that we help people start, almost all of them, have sliding scale tuition, which means that, for example, Brooklyn Preschool, which is one of the schools we started, has mostly minority kids. Really? And, and the same thing with Pono in New York City and many others of our schools. <clears throat> They're not elitist schools. Many of them are not pri primarily even white schools. And so, yes, it can be done. That's how we're doing it, because to try to change within the system, I found out doesn't really work in the long run, which was the criticism that you were quoting me about. Well, that's really exciting. And uh, I'm so pleased to hear it. Um, a question. And actually, when I think about it, I, 
I think I once visited Brooklyn Free School and noticed exactly this. But maybe we should... Br Henning's waiting for a go. Well, after Henning, perhaps... Or perhaps we should let him wait. <laughs> no. Um, but uh, I know John has some views on this. He does feel that um, it's not just a question of money, but it's a question of culture as well. So maybe we could hear from Henning and then John. That, that was my question. It was exactly my question for John. If I understand, if I've understood uh, your writings, uh, then uh, it's not only economy which plays a role. Uh, can you explain maybe on uh, that? Yes. Uh, if, if uh, as in America, with certain people, uh, certain minorities, uh, brown and black in particular, if, if, if life was a matter of survival, and it is, it's a matter of survival. Uh, that's why Black Lives Matter movement started not only the liberation of the black community, but it's survival. So in situations where you're at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy and you're worried about survival and meeting those basic needs, then those basic needs should uh, 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 be what education is about. Not that in the case of democratic schools and what Derry did as far as having a democratic experience for black students, so they can learn the system because that's part of being empowered is learning the democratic system. And the way to learn that is to do it in a school, in a democratic school. But the democratic school also has to realize that there's two different definitions of freedom, two different definitions of liberation. And we need to talk about those different definitions of, of freedom and liberation and realize that for some parents and families and communities, survival at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy is what's important and with the implication that a lot of democratic schools are in the middle of, of Maslow's hierarchy and maybe even self-actualization is their issue. But for certain groups, getting past the survival needs is, is what's important and respecting that. And as I'll ask my next question for Derry, we both agreed that hip hop can be a way for a democratic education movement to be more inclusive and diverse. Do you agree with that statement? Because I, I'm arguing that the hip hop, global hip hop movement is a way for the democratic education movement to move in and get the respect of, of uh, minority groups in America who are trying to uh, survive and, and move up Maslow's hierarchy. What do you think about hip hop, Terry, and the the idea of involving them? Well, I, I'm really interested. I, 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 as you know, it says in the blurb to my book, um, young people are natural learners and they need time and space to develop their interests and passions. In schools where teachers and students collaborate, respecting democracy and human rights. They do not need exam factories. And right. you wrote to me and you said, this is a hip hop book. Well, yeah. what do you mean? Because you're talking about liberation. You're talking about uh, uh, keeping it real. You're talking about social justice, being authentic, being who you are, because you've been that way, fighting the power. I know you all know about fighting the power, the, the, uh, what, what hip hop's about. You're fighting authority. You're fighting the man, you're fighting the system. You're as hip hop as can be because you've been the same as long as I've known you. You're not a poser, you're not some fake, and you're concerned about social justice. That's what hip hop is concerned about, keeping it real, keeping it right, and, and you're a homeboy, and that's what you're doing. I think we have, uh, some, we have, we have some, some other participants who want to um, Yeah, I'm done something. talking. Oh, yes, please. And could I thank Dottie for coming back because she joined us yesterday and I see she's come back. And I watched the film Education, uh, Education. Um, today. Or I got through most of it and I can see what you found really interesting about it. Of course, it, it's, it, it, it was about 40 years back, the, the period in which yeah. it's set. But you could say nothing's changed. 
Some of the names have changed, but for the experience of kids being treated like that, nothing's changed. Quite appalling. Anyway, sorry. Um, uh, please jump in, anyone who's got something to say. Well, I, I put a link in there to a, a freedom school in Philadelphia, San Kofa, and it, it's a charter school. So your charter schools, they're publicly funded schools, and they're probably the closest we're going to get in the United States to democratic schools. Because the, the, the charter schools, I mean, they have to do the 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 state required curriculum, but they have more flexibility than public schools. And, and I, I worked in alternative education years ago. And with this, in, in a school that I had worked in, the school, the kids started a portfolio and every year they added to, that's when we they were using VCRs. And when they felt like they were ready to graduate, they, graduate, they, they would just graduate. I mean, it was like, I don't think they were really following any type of um, curriculum because, you know, most of them weren't going to college. But back to Sankofa, I had, a, I had the opportunity to visit the school. And, and at that time, it was, in the, it was in the neighborhood that I grew up in Philadelphia, which was in the, the northeast part. And they've since moved to a, a building in what's called the Kensington area, which is a really low poverty area. But the with the charter schools, the parents, the charter schools are free. They, they, they're public schools, but they're free. Yep. And, and this, is, this is precisely my point, Dottie, really, that somehow we've got to find a way of making these schools free. Um, and I, I mean, it was great to hear Jerry's contribution and lovely to hear yours. And I think there are quite a few, you could call them progressive, nearly democratic school charter schools, some of them extremely interesting um, in, in, in the US. Um, can I just comment to Manu? Manu said, uh, they tried to buy the book today and, and the download didn't work. Uh, that's a shame because, I mean, eight people have managed to do a download today because I get feedback from Smashwords. Um, perhaps you'd like to try Amazon. It's, it's on Amazon as a paperback um, and it's a bit more expensive, but I'll happily, I'll happily refund the money if you email me with a PayPal account number. Well, $30. I just want to make one point, and maybe a little bit more bluntly uh, than I've been making it. Um, to me, the attitude that black kids and black families, uh, for some reason, don't want to go to democratic schools or whatever, to me is racist. Uh, I just don't like the approach. And it's, if, as you said, Barry, very quick, briefly in passing, oh, yeah, you think you visited Brooklyn Preschool. If you visit Brooklyn Preschool, you'll see that a majority of the kids are minority kids, and they're very happily there. And it's true of a number of our, of our other schools. If you set up a situation in which they can join, that's fine. The problem with charter schools is that what our people have discovered once they got involved with them is that they suck you slowly back into the system. They, it's the only exception to that, as you said, is Israel, you know, where it's actually institutionalized that you can start a real democratic school. But I, I just want to make that point. There, it, it's not that you could, or it's almost, those are democratic schools, Brooklyn Free School, Pono, Albany Free School, the democratic schools. They have a lot of minority kids. They're very happily there. It wasn't. I was getting confused, Jerry. Yeah. It, it was Brooklyn Free School that I visited, not Albany Free. Is that what we're talking about? No. And I, you're absolutely right. Brooklyn Free School, that is my memory. And I'm very, very pleased to be corrected on this. Um, school is the school we started. Albany Free School has been around for 55 years, but it's still a lot of minority kids. And that was designed that way by Mary Loya. Yeah. And that was Chris's school, am I right? That's Chris right. Masogliano. 
So okay, I, how I, do you how do you get round the fee? I'm, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you, Derry. Um, uh, Maro has asked me to moderate the meeting because she's not feeling well, and oh. I see that several people are showing up to talk. Um, so I take over the moderation. Okay, if it's okay. Please do. I see we got twenty three people here. I thought everyone would be gone by now. That's amazing. <laughs> John, John, what? Uh, it's your turn. I never said myself that black people this is what black people told me i'm not saying that that's what they told me so jerry you're gonna have to have a a conversation with them not me you're misconstruing it's not racist unless you want to call them racist which i don't think black people are racist but i can get you the information to talk with people about why they uh don't want uh, the the type of freedom is not conducive to their survival. They, they, I don't doubt that they said that to you, John, but I think- Well, thank that, you. Then you have to say that. You can't say no, that. I still I'm think saying that, that they rejected. The concept that I hear over and over again, that that would be a general case, I don't agree with at all. And Well, the then your that, argument's with them. The proof of that, I, I, don't, I don't doubt that they, from their experience and whatever that situation was, might, might say that. Or what I, you talk to some Brooklyn preschool parents, you will not get that attitude from minority people. Well, okay, so, Brooklyn, so okay. Uh, Brooklyn Free School is a middle class black. The black folks I talked to were uh, working class. I didn't talk to any educated, sophisticated, or enlightened. Okay, and uh, uh, tuition. So there are welfare kids. I'm there. sorry, Jerry, I stop you now because I am doing the moderation. Um, it seems that we have two experiences here, some experience which John is referring to and some experience with which Jerry is uh, referring to, okay? Could you tell us about the situation in Germany, in Berlin, uh, Henning? Do you have a, really, a real social mix, an ethnic mix in your school? No. That was quick. Quite frankly, no. <laughs> our school, I, I like, I love our school and I always defend our school and I, I always defend our school if people say uh, it's elitist because there's a reason and you pointed it out, uh, Derry, um, we have to, uh, we have to get money from the parents tuition and but I think it's not the only reason why only uh, a certain a certain people visit our school. I think it's not the only reason. E economy is not the only reason because uh, we have um, parents who don't have very much money. They, some of our parents live on state funds, but still they can somehow manage to send their kids to our school. And um, so it's not about money only, it's also about, I don't know what, but it's a certain spectrum from society, which is visiting our school and we, we are aware of it. And I think we have to be, um, I think we have to be um, clear about it. Uh, honest about it, I wanted to say, we have to be honest about it. And if we, we are not honest about it, we can't change it. We won't change it. We, maybe, we wa maybe we don't want to change it. Okay, then let's be honest about it. Bruno, you have a question? Yeah, thank you so much for bringing up this matter because I think it's a discussion that we should have and much more than we have. And I have, I have just a question, maybe in general. Do you think that all the values from, let's say, democratic education meet the needs of those uh, communities that are not represented that much now in democratic education? Because I'm thinking like in certain places or in certain situations, I don't know if people can afford their, that their young people don't learn to read until they are 14, let's say. Whereas in other Sudbury school or democratic schools, that should be allowed, right? Yeah. So do you think is there like a, I don't know if to say tension or gap between the needs of all the people and then the values of democratic education? Yes, there's 
I've been studying how this can work together. Let me say right here, there's not been a democratic Sudbury school started by all black folks. Yeah. The Brooklyn Free School is started by people who look like me and look like Jerry. There's not one democratic school, Sudbury Valley School, started by black folks and run by black folks. Back to your point, sir. Now we have to need a conversation because I already talked about how they can, and hip hop especially is a way to, to uh, get this compromise where you have a democratic school where students learn how the democratic life and how it might be led and other things, but that the basic needs of them in order to be in a democratic society, knowing how to read and write and converse, knowing how to community organize. In other words, the school has to be political. The democratic schools for urban children have to be political. Now, Jerry's school and the so-called democratic schools, they're political, they just don't want to admit it. They, they got an agenda, they just don't want to admit it. I'm admitting that their schools are political sites, but that for these you're talking to, learning how to read and write, and the school itself has to have a political agenda that's based on existential issues. I'd like to comment on this one too, because in one of the schools I worked in, I found there were some 14-year-olds coming on 15, and at that time you left school in England at 15, or you could, um, who couldn't read. And they'd managed to get through, let's think, five to 15, 10 years of compulsory schooling, and they hadn't learned to read. But what they had learned is how to cover up. And the film that Dottie and I were talking about is about exactly such a kid, the strategies that kids develop to cover up the fact that they haven't learned to read. And I'm afraid, I mean, one of these kids who was supposed to be remedial, when I, I, when I moved to this area, I had a small farm and I had sheep and he used to come over and help me when the lambs were coming. He would come over and show me how to do a breech presentation, for example, with a sheep, how to get the lamb out without the mother or the lamb dying. And this kid was brilliant. He knew all about sheep and he, could, he was an absolute superb midwife for sheep. And yet he'd been told he was stupid and useless and put in the remedial class. Well, I thought it was absolutely crucial and my responsibility to make sure that, and there were about five of them who couldn't read, I discovered, to make sure that they were able to read by the time they left school. I didn't have long, I just had a few months. But once they were turned on to the idea that they could learn to read, there was no stopping them. It was just kind of turning a switch that had been switched off when they were much younger. And one of the approaches I took was you mustn't feel ashamed of the situation you're in. You must understand the forces that have been at work that have got you to this place where you can't read and you're covering it up. And I was busy reading Pedagogy of the Oppressed at this time. I had it very much in my mind. So... I thought this was a conscientization approach, and you're right, um, John, when you say this becomes political or is political, because I helped these kids learn to read. I couldn't sleep if I believed that I had allowed these kids to start their working lives unable to read. It would have ruled out so many jobs, and they were already disadvantaged working class fam kids, often from one parent families. And then there's the other problem, the middle class kids who had teased these kids and made them feel very uncomfortable. I thought, well, you can't blame them either. This is how kids are. But they need to be helped to understand the privileged position that some of them are in and the advantages that they've got that some kids haven't got. And if, you, if the kids from the school were going to go out and be good citizens, I felt it was important for both groups to reflect on what, who they were and how they got that way. But it's extremely difficult because if you do this kind of work with middle class kids, you run the risk of the parents phoning up saying, how dare you 
make my child feel guilty because they want to learn at school. It has to be handled very delicately, and I don't think I ever solved the problem. I don't think I ever learned to do it well. But fortunately, when I became principal or acting principal of a school, we made damn sure that nobody got to 15 or 16 unable to read. I don't disagree with the democratic school's approach to reading, but it's a luxury I felt we couldn't afford in a big state school with working class kids. Is anyone going to want to beat me up for saying that? I... I'm not. No. Okay, is anybody, does anybody want to speak? I don't see anybody at the moment. Could I invite ah, Carl? Gabriel. Is, is Carl Rust still here? Carl, are you still here? He I was going to, to ask here. him. To, I was going to ask him to talk about his book, but he's gone. No, he's there. Oh, he's Can here. You Can you hear me though? I wasn't yes, sure about perfect. My audio. Hear you perfectly, Carl. Uh, Tell us a bit about your book, and then we'll hear from Gabrielle. Well, I was thirty years in public education, and and. Um, in my last five years, I spent working in an alternative program for elementary kids that we did self-directed. And I, through a lot of those experiences, I wrote a book about how some ways that we could transfer public education. Um, most of the kids in my program were minority kids, but that wasn't something that they actually chose. Uh, being an alternative program, we had a few families that chose to be involved, but most of the families, had, it was either this or sit at home. And, and be what we call homeschooled, or not homeschooled, but uh, we call it homebound education where a teacher comes and visits you once or twice a week or meets you at the library or whatever. So those are the choices. Our kids, over time, <clears throat> I think a lot of the parents and the kids became valued the democratic process, but initially there was a lot of resistance to it. And um, I kind of put a note in the chat that I think a lot of people at the bottom of the pyramid, like uh, John was talking about, are convinced that conventional education is a way out of that. And um, a lot of people have experienced that, that they became educated and that was their ticket out of poverty and out of being in a disadvantaged position. So, but there's a lack of awareness that there are different ways of doing things. You can do things differently, like your book says, Terry, there is a different way you can go. But, um, and I don't want to take too much time, but um, another group I'm a part of is Unschooling School, and we take the position that public schools are owned by taxpayers. Now, taxpayers have the right to demand the kind of education that they want, and including parents and kids and teachers and everybody has a right to say, this is a public school. We pay for it. We are the owners. We demand that you meet our needs. And... Um, if, it, if every school had a self-directed option, I think a lot of people would become aware of it and be willing to try it. They may not be the first ones to jump on the boat, but I think they would be willing to try it once they saw how it works. Get Out of the Way and Let Kids Learn is my book. It's, it's on Amazon. Tell us about the new book, Carl, just quickly. Oh, yeah. The new book, How We Blew Up Our School. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> It's about a fifth grade class where the teacher decides to experiment with democracy and just kind of the uproar with the parents and the administrators and how the kids live it. It sounds a lot like your story, Derry. I think I stole your life story and put it into a book. <laughs> but I'm about, I, I've started serializing and I'm not even finished with the thing, but I've started serializing it so people can read the parts that I put up and give me some feedback on that. Thanks, Carl. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're, we're, trespassing, we're trespassing into Gabrielle's session now. Yeah. So maybe maybe we should listen to him. Good uh, night. Do you have to go, John? Oh, no, I thought we had to end. Well, uh, I think we've I, had our time, but um, Gabrielle's, the, Ga Gabrielle's running the next session. Just so I thought it would be a good idea to let him talk now. I, I don't... <laughs> I'm not. No, no, I, I don't uh, run the next session. I just wanted to comment something. The oh. next session begins in half an hour. Oh, great. So we have half an hour left. Uh, Gabriel, do we, Gabriel, 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 do, Gabriel, do you want to say something? 
Yes, I wanted to share my experience here. Um, we are in a wealthy European area where, well, we are on a sunny island where many rich people who can afford it of whole Europe is coming over. So uh, we run this uh, little free democratic school in nature in the middle of this wealthy area. I mean, there's also poverty, um, but it, there would be many, many families which could afford it. And what, my experience was... What country? What country? Spain, Canary Islands. Sorry. Okay. So um, my experience was that is, um, of course, and I totally agree, and I totally think we should talk about this criticism of um, economical exclusivity of uh, private alternative schools. I totally agree with that. And we have to be very aware of that. This is uh, one, one important part of the whole discussion. But the other one, the more psychological or pedagogical one is, that what I experienced, that many people who were able to pay our fee because they pay other fees which are more expensive, or for, for example, for British schools, even of people, friends of mine, which were like half of pseudo alternative with when you're talking to them, they have like this kind of talk like, yeah, we should all live back in tribes and stuff. And so they have this half alternative perspective on life. Um, but when it comes to education, they prefer to send their kids to, to the conventional, and especially to the elitarian people, because they um, want them to have success. So, um, or they don't want to risk it. They say, whoa, 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 what, what is this? They don't really get into the argument. They don't get really into the concept, and they don't want to take risk on the child's education, and they stay with the established one. And money is not, not the question at all. And I think we can, uh, we have to be critical about that, because you, this is what I always uh, tell to parents when they're interested, that it's hard to um, believe in your child's uh, potential if you haven't discovered your own potential. And it's hard to believe that your child will be free if you are not really free yourself. And this is the, the psychological dimension why people don't get into democratic education, because yeah. they, they are not free themselves. They're like in the, inside their box and they, they can't you know, this is this argument. Well, what would kids do if they have, if you let them free? With what people say is what they wanted to do themselves, probably. Yeah, they would do nothing. Maybe this is what you would like to do: do nothing all day long. So I think this is also important, not just uh, the the economical aspect. I, I agree with you, Gabriel. And I think, I, I mean, I absolutely would include your school and Martina's school in Belgium as pioneers of possibility. You're doing something that nobody else is doing. And if you have to charge fees to prove that it's valuable, then I'm OK with that. But it's just where we go from there um, that worries me. And you mentioned the British schools. Well, of course, Britain has one of the worst class ridden systems in the world. I mean, 7 percent of our kids go to elite private schools. They become 90 percent of the judges. 80% of the top medical profession, 75% of journalists go to these schools where only 7% of the kids are. So their influence on society and our prime ministers, idiots like our current prime minister, for example, they all come from the same school. It's unbelievable that our last three prime ministers, all, apart from Mar uh, apart from. Um, the lady whose name I forget, I have a problem remembering the names of conservative prime ministers. But the influence of this minority of schools and parents send their kids to these schools, not because they're going to get high exam marks even, it's who they're going to meet. They're going to meet the people who are going to be their influential friends as they proceed up the various economic and social ladders of our society. So, you know, I'm almost embarrassed to say that I'm English. In fact, sometimes I prefer to say that I'm Irish because my dad did cut, was a bus driver from Dublin. Anyway, um, you, that's Derry. great to know. Who's, who's next, Henning? Jerry. Yeah. Jerry, it's your turn. Yeah, okay. So people do like to shut me up. It's interesting how that works. Uh, but I, I uh, uh, Jerry, I will shut you up uh, if you would just take the word without calling you. It's the uh, way it, it works. It's the way it works. 
if you want, we, if you want, we can do uh, Robert Rules of Order. <laughs> I have no problem with it. So it's your turn, Jerry. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. So I ran a school for 17 years where 90% of the kids were low income or welfare. Uh, and at that school, uh, the parents were fine with the kids being there. The kids went there of their own choice. When we tested them using standardized tests, they improved in all the subject areas at an average of two and a half times the national rate. So this I'm translating to the people who sign up for our school starters course. And so we started about a hundred schools. If you look on our website, you'll see the websites of a hundred schools and a map of them all over the world. But one of the things that most of those schools are doing is having a sliding scale tuition so they're not elitist schools. Because this is translating what I believe very strongly, what I've seen with my own eyes, and what I know is true. Thank you. Next, nobody's showing up hands. Yes, uh, John and then Derry. John, uh, you have to unmute yourself. I hope it works. I just want to remind people, certain groups in America, in particular minorities, when you say democracy, that is a way they've been controlled through democracy, not only through the history of, of democracy, where basically, if you're in a minority situation, you get to vote, but you never have any power. So democracy has been used as an excuse. Hey, look, you get to vote, shut up. But we, we always, we never get the majority. <clears throat> My point is, as, as uh, our discussion, we have to slowly get a compromise between <clears throat> the freedom school, the free school and the public school in regard to certain minorities in America because, and, and reinterpret some of this terminology because they're afraid of it. It's been used to control them. Thank you, John. Derry. Derry, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Now, I apologize for interrupting, but I could hardly hear Jerry. He's very, very quiet, almost, almost not there. Oh, you didn't hear what Jerry said? Some of it. Okay, what, what did, uh, okay. Uh, uh, Jerry, can you uh, repeat what you said for, uh, for, for Derry? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jerry, you, have, you are muted. I think, Jerry, you already know it, I think, but the school that I ran was mostly low-income welfare kids, 90% anyway. Uh, tuition was never charged based, people came and then we figured out what they could afford or they figured out what they could afford. That's how the school worked. We became very good at fundraising. That's where most of our, our money came from. We had bingos and all that. Bingo was started by one of our welfare kids to make sure that kids like him would always be able to go there. And so that translated over to the school starters course. It's still a very basic part of my philosophy. And I just don't want to hear that they're not interested in this. I think that if you create the situation, they will be interested in it because that was my experience for 17 years. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, yeah, I got it. Thanks, Henning. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I can make a comment. Um, I agree with what Jerry's saying. I think when people become aware of how this works, they like it. The part of the problem is that there's sometimes, I mean, you start a hundred schools and that's great. And there's thousands of these places all over the world, but compared with the massive conventional school system, 
it's, it's still a drop in the bucket. So in my state of Indiana, you would have to drive either to Chicago or Southern Indiana, or there's a, there's a couple of possibilities in Michigan that's not too far. But what I'm saying is there is nothing in my county for people to look at other than the program that I started, which is still going, but they tend to keep those things kind of hidden under a basket. And uh, for whatever reason, they don't really want people to know. I have the same experience that Jerry had with test scores. Our test scores were, we beat the average, every, not everybody improved, but most people improved. And the longer you were with us, the better you did. But I couldn't, uh, it was, it was, it's hard to spread those. When I, I visited Ann Arbor Open School in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is a public school, which is not totally free and democratic, but it's got some nice um, age mixing. It's got some nice freedom of movement. It's got uh, it's negotiated curriculum. And their test scores were great compared with the rest of the state. But when I asked the assistant principal, does anybody come to study this? Is anybody wanting to replicate it? No, people aren't interested. So I think the, the key is just continue to talk to people that maybe don't know that these things are real and they really work. I think personally that democratic Sudbury Valley model, agile learning, whatever you wanna call it, can work for any group. And it can work extremely well for any group. But I think there are some barriers for some people. And I think Thank that's you. all John is saying. Thank you, Carl. Uh, John is next. John, you have you up to unmute yourself. Uh, I think freedom schools, the term freedom schools is a better way to approach this. And one more point, the test, the standardized test is see how white you are. So that's not a judge. I, I don't want black people judged on how white they are. But back to my point, I think the concept of freedom schools is the way to uh, merge these two points. Which two points? Uh, uh, democratic education for white people in, in majority and how to attract more diversity in regard to marginalized groups who are concerned with survival, existential issues and freedom and liberation from these existential issues. And I think a free school concept would be a better way uh, to get what Carl wants uh, into the minds of, of people uh, who, uh, yeah, a freedom school. I've talked about that. Thank you. Uh, Derry, you have to unmute yourself. I'm, yes, is this you? Mutes me every time, even though yes. I'm a good boy and not speaking. <laughs> okay, I see. Exercise of power. Um, something I didn't mention, actually, um, in this first class that I had um, in, in this secondary modern school, I thought I'd get fired and I didn't. The second year I got put in charge of all the seven classes as they moved up a year and we were able to introduce the sort of democracy and uh, self-directed learning to all the 240 kids in, in that year group. Not that I agree with year segregation, I don't, but that's how it was in that school. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I'll jump in again then, there's no one saying anything. Is that acceptable, sir, or have you muted me? Hey, you haven't muted me. No. Um, <laughs> okay, you're too slow. And uh, the head teacher got a bit worried about my democratic class, I think, were these kids learning anything? So that he wanted to give them a test and I couldn't really stop him as I was in my first year of teaching and he was allowing me to be a kind of crazy guy, troublemaker in the school. And uh, so he ran a test right through all the 230, 230 40 kids and um, it was slightly embarrassing. It was really a general knowledge and verbal reasoning test. Um, it was slightly embarrassing just how much better my class did than the other classes. Um, 
And in fact, it led to a bit of a problem for me because I had one or two parents from the other classes phone the head teacher and say they wanted my, their kids transferred into my class. Uh, that didn't help me make good relationships with my colleagues, um, though eventually they forgave and forgot. Um, and we worked together as a team the following year. Um, but the, it is interesting that when kids become confident learners, um, they seem to do well in any kind of situation. I mean, several of the kids that I taught in that, uh, in that class went on to go to university and get degrees. And one of them ended up as a head teacher of a school. He's just retired. He ended up as head teacher of an elementary school. He ran his own school in a very democratic way and was guiding other teachers of elementary schools in the town how to make their schools more democratic. And that was 45 years after the democratic class. So I think it can, it can last and you can do good work in state schools. Thank you, Dave. I, well, I just wonder, Carl, nobody's talking. Has he muted? Uh, yes, Gabriel is wonderful. Oh, oh Gabriel, okay. <laughs> Gabriel, it's your turn. Yeah, I wanted to bring in um, the libertarian movement of the anarchist tradition in Spain. I haven't heard a lot about it, a lot about it in the democratic movement, and I haven't got the chance to really look into it. But I think there are quite a lot um, parallels, and this libertarian movement, um, or well, educational movement, um, has been quite important with this uh, social transformation perspective so i don't know if you if you really know about it or if it's really known in the democratic movement because i think um there are very very well big um parallels but yeah the social aspect is is in there i don't know if it's present in the democratic movement derry uh derry you have to, have to unmute yourself you're muted, Derry. I was just saying, is, is Jerry still here? Because Jerry knows a lot about the Ferris School in, in New York, I think it was, that came out of the Spanish anarchist schools. Jerry, it seems to be here. Well, sort of. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm on my way out. I got to teach table tennis. But what was the thing about the, about the modern school? No, about yes. the, yeah. What about it? Uh, Gabriel was saying that um, the modern schools, the Ferrer schools, the anarchist schools in Spain don't seem to feature very much in democratic education discussions. And I said, I thought you knew quite a lot about the school in New York. Right. Well, there was hundreds of them around the world that started after Ferrer was killed in Spain, including a lot in Spain, which ended with Franco. Uh, there was one in New York City. Again, these were mostly low income, a lot of Jewish immigrant kids and stuff like that. They eventually moved to and had sort of a community in Stelton, New Jersey. And the amazing thing is they were so profoundly affected by that school that they continue to have reunions every year. This year they were in their late 80s and they still had a reunion. Uh, this one was online. I helped to organize it. But uh, so this is another example of a de totally democratic school that was for mostly low income kids. Okay. Anybody else? We have uh, 20 minutes and we have 10 minutes left. Now, seven minutes left uh, until the next session. Maybe we should stop here. What do you think? Derry. Could I just say that if anyone's having trouble downloading my book, I'm really sorry about that. As I say, eight, eight people have managed it today. Um, but buy it on Amazon and I'll refund the money. Uh, Gabriel? 
And, well, I would like to give one last hint about the UNESCO, to the, um, about the Futures of Education UNESCO paper that we're working on the response to it. I think this is also connected to what we are talking here tonight. So I just wanted to point that out, that tomorrow afternoon uh, we, we have this presentation of this response to UNESCO's Futures of Education, which I think is quite important when we're talking about all this. Thank you very, very much. Okay, so there are five minutes left uh, until the next uh, till, uh, till the next session starts. Um, thank you, Derry. Thank you, John, for this uh, debate. And um, see you soon in the next session, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure who's who's doing the moderation for the next session, but I will find out. So thank you again, John. Thank you again, Derry. Thank you again, Jerry. Thank you again, all the people who have participated. Thank you. Take care. Kenning? Yes. I really appreciate it. I was not feeling very well. <clears throat> thank you so much. It was great.